All right, hello again, everyone. So I should introduce myself first. I forgot about myself. All right, I am Lynn Paddock. I am in the Russian department here at Dartmouth College, and I am very pleased to welcome you and Nina Jankowitz. Um, I'm welcoming her on behalf of the Wright Center for Computation and Just Communities, which is housed within the Newcomb Institute here at Dartmouth. Our particular working group, Fake News, Propaganda, and Narrative Force was founded by Petra McGillen in the German department, um, Dan Rockmore in computer science, and me, Lynn Paddock, in Russian, and has focused this year on critical information studies. This is our second year of existence. Um, and so, uh, we bring to you today prof uh, 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 Nina Jankowitz, who brings a unique perspective from outside academia and the world of research and think tanks. This event could not happen, of course, without a lot of help and support. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank the generous support of the Wright Center and also Christine Monagal for making this event possible this evening. Um, I'd also like to let you know that there was a wonderful reception outside after the talk. So please feel free to stop and join us and also to ask Nina any questions that you may have remaining after the Q&A session at the talk. Um, so I would also like to thank Susan Bryson, who is our new incoming director of the Wright Center, and we look forward to collaborating and working more with her next year, and also to Dan Rockmore, who I don't think is with us this evening, but we are grateful for all of his inspiring brainstorming and productive collaboration in these past couple of years. So um, Nina Jankowitz, our guest, is an internationally recognized expert on disinformation and democratization and the author of two books, How to Lose the Information War by Bloomsbury, which was published in 2020, and which The New Yorker called a persuasive new book on disinformation as a geopolitical strategy and um, How to Be a Woman Online, published again by Bloomsbury in 2022, which is an examination of online abuse and disinformation and tips for fighting back, uh, which Booklist named Essential Reading. Currently, the Vice President at the UK-based Center for Information Resilience, a nonprofit focused on countering disinformation, Jankowitz has advised governments, international organizations, and tech companies, and testified before the US Congress, UK Parliament, and European Parliament. In 2022, Jankowitz was appointed to lead the Disinformation Governance Board, an interagency um, uh, organization on best practices and a coordinating entity at the Department of Homeland Security. She resigned from the position after a sustained disinformation campaign against her, which caused the Biden administration to abandon the project. From 2017 to 2022, Jankowitz has held fellowships at the Wilson Center on women and freedom of expression around the world. She advised the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry on strategic communications under the auspices of a Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellowship in 2016-2017. Early in her career, she managed democracy assistance programs in Russia and Belarus at the National Democratic Institute. And with that short biography of Nina Jankowitz, I'd like to turn it over to her. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and, and thanks everybody for this somewhat um, un unorthodox setup here. I, I thought I might have a podium, but they don't have them in a science building, despite Christine's efforts to find me one. So we're just gonna we're gonna be quite casual tonight, and I'm gonna uh, read from my notes because I chose these words carefully, and I want to make sure that uh, that we get them right. So I'm really, really delighted to be uh, here at Dartmouth for the first time. Um, as I was telling Lynn just before this, my favorite events are ones where I get to get outside of Washington, outside of the Beltway, learn from my audiences and I'm challenged on my ideas and I think personally that these uh, types of interactions are key to dismantling disinformation. 
So as I begin, I want to dispel the notion that disinformation is something that we should simply accept or something that's a normal part of politics, that it's just lying, right? Disinformation or the use of false or misleading information spread with malign intent is dismantling democracy here in the United States and around the world. In late February, we marked one year since Vladimir Putin launched his full-scale invasion of Ukraine a bloody and senseless war built on a worldwide disinformation campaign. And at home, of course, over the past almost seven years, we've seen millions of individuals taken in by disinformation, closing the already shrinking gap between the online and the offline. They have endangered public health, falsely claiming that the coronavirus isn't real or that COVID vaccines contain microchips that are meant to track us. And of course, they've endangered public safety storming the Capitol on January 6th. Adherents of the QAnon conspiracy have engaged in violence. Just as one example, in September, a Michigan man shot and killed his wife, the family dog, and injured his daughter after being radicalized by the theory. And during 2022, in our midterm elections, you'll remember that 60%, a full 60% of voters, had a candidate who denied the results of the 2020 election on the ballot. Now, they didn't win, uh, most of them anyway, but I don't think that that should uh, in instill a false sense of complacency in us. We still very much have a problem. And my own life has been changed markedly by disinformation. If not for the disinformation campaign against me, which Lynn mentioned, and the working group that I was appointed to lead within the Department of Homeland Security, my family wouldn't have been violently threatened. That working group would still exist, and I would probably not be here today. I'd still be serving in government. At its core, disinformation is antithetical to democracy. We need good information to participate in the democratic process. And those who traffic in disinformation are knowingly dismantling it. My own recent experience shows that this is a truth nearly seven years after revelations about Russian interference in the 2016 election came to light. We still seem not to fully understand. And that's why I wrote my first book, How to Lose the Information War. It travels to the front lines of this informational conflict in Central and Eastern Europe. And it interviews the folks who have been in this battle much longer than we have. So today I'm gonna to tell you a few stories. One from 2017 is the story of a group of progressive activists that found themselves unwittingly in the center of a Russian disinformation campaign. It shows the importance of the individual encountering disinformation and working to repair polarization. And frankly, shows us that it's not just Republicans or you know, your crazy Aunt Sally or Uncle Joe who are the ones that are buying into disinformation campaigns. Another story from the Czech Republic should be a warning to governments attempting to combat disinformation. And then finally, I'll tell you my own experience as the subject of a disinformation campaign. This demonstrates how the US government still doesn't take this problem seriously and how partisan disinformation undermines democracy and inspires hate for our fellow Americans. Ultimately, these stories speak to an important point. Disinformation doesn't just come from outside our borders. The problem is increasingly inside the house. Our own political parties use these tactics the same tactics that our foreign adversaries are using to influence discourse. We're doing our adversaries work for them when we don't recognize that disinformation knows no political party. It is not a partisan issue, it is a democratic one. And we're becoming less free in the process. So I noticed early in my career that there's a uniquely American hubris to our approach to disinformation and countering it, particularly when it comes to Russia. We seemed to think back in 2014, 2015, 2016, that we were the first people this happened to, which couldn't be farther from the truth. Of course, the Soviet Union was involved in propaganda and active measures campaigns throughout the communist period. But in the internet era, Russia has auditioned and perfected its tactics in nations like Estonia, the Republic of Georgia, Poland, the Czech Republic, and in Ukraine. I was in Ukraine working as a strategic communications advisor in Ukraine's foreign ministry during the 2016 election and its aftermath. And while I was there, 
it became clear that while we in the West have been slow off the starting block, unable to recognize the dividing lines in our societies, and that disinformation is weaponizing them, we've also been unwi un unwilling to admit that our fellow citizens draw them. And in all of that, Russia has us lapped. Although its goal is increased global influence, Russia's disinformation campaigns operate on an undeniably human level, often employing local actors to cast a spell of plausible deniability and increase the authenticity of their message. Our response so far has existed almost entirely in two realms. The government realm has consisted of classified briefings, of sanctions, of taskers, and talking points. And I experienced all of this during my short stint in government to a very frustrating peak. While in the tech realm, executives believe in content curation, in fact checking, in furious games of what I call whack-a-troll, removing fake accounts created by malign actors only to see others pop up. And like the carnival game of whack-a-mole, whack-a-troll is all but unwinnable. Neither tech platforms, nor governments, nor journalists can fact check their way out of the crisis of truth and of trust that Western democracy currently faces. Keeping people at the heart of Western policy on the Kremlin's and other disinformation campaigns is not only critical in responding to Russia's online offensives, but in repairing the cracks in our democracies that allowed them to begin in the first place. If we don't, our efforts are just been a, going to become another cautionary tale and another example of how to lose the information war. So I've, I've given you a little hint about this already, but unlike many other stories that, about Russian disinformation you may have heard since 2016, the one I'm about to tell doesn't focus on botnets or the number of engagements a particular post got. It's not about the 2016 election, and it's only tangentially about former President Trump. I hope that it will challenge many of the popular conceptions you have about disinformation and hopefully inform how you think about this problem. It's not one that targets one political party more than another, but one that threatens our democracy, no matter your party affiliation. It shows us that part of any strategy to win the information war needs to think about how we arm individuals for the fight. What tools do they need, do you need, to navigate an increasingly treacherous information environment. So our story begins just over, at this point, five years ago, uh, when a criminal complaint on Russian interference in the 2016 election was unsealed. It laid out how the St. Petersburg-based Internet Research Agency, or IRA, funded and implemented its online influence campaigns in the US. And the level of detail in this, in this document is astonishing. It uncovers the budget of the IRA, or the troll factory, as we all know it. It reveals this conspiracy's organizational structure. It details communications between employees of the Internet Research Agency. But one detail in particular stood out to me. It says, on or about July 1st, 2017, a member of the conspiracy contacted the Facebook accounts for three real US organizations to inquire about collaborating with these groups on an anti-President Trump flash mob at the White House, which was already being organized by the groups for July 4th, 2017. Now, this detail was shockingly familiar to me. Community theater has always been a hobby of mine. Shocking, I know, as I sit here and gesticulate, right? Um, and I recalled some of my friends posting about a July 4th flash mob. They planned to dress up in colonial attire, as only theater people would do, at the height of Washington's muggy summer to sing a parody of Do You Hear the People Sing from Les Mis in front of the so-called People's House. Now, the event page for this flash mob has long since been removed from Facebook, but in the age of live streaming, it wasn't difficult for me to find videos of these festivities, where several hundred people gathered in front of the White House, dressed up as revolutionaries, uh, complete with tri-corner hats, and saying things like, resist the rule of, of treasonous King Donald, who has betrayed the republic and offered his soul and conscience to the czar of Russia and consigned American welfare to ruin. You, you get the idea, right? It was very theatrical. Everybody was waving their American flags and cheering. Now, what's interesting about all this isn't, isn't that it's theater people. According to the criminal complaint, the Internet Research Agency had spent $80 to buy ads on Facebook to promote the event. 
in an entirely unexpected collision of my two great loves, Russia and musical theater, it seemed that Russia had weaponized show tunes. Now this triggered something troubling for me. How many Americans were currently in Facebook groups or Twitter threads or any other social media platform where Russian actors, or any other foreign actors for that matter, were laundering disinformation, seeding it within our authentic American discourse? Since 2016, the bulk of our collection, collective action to, or attention to Russian election interference in the media, on social media platforms, et cetera, has been focused on fake accounts and outright disinformation. And companies like Twitter and Facebook were issuing regular takedown reports as part of their furious game of whack-a-troll. They were saying, you know, we've taken down this many foreign accounts today. That's great, but we had no way of verifying it, right? And Congress's focus for a long time was on the illicit purchase of campaign ads in, in rubles and on uh, content moderation policies. But in that time, since 2016, online information operations have become more diffuse and more sophisticated. They're adapting their tactics to increase scrutiny. And rather than simply creating fake accounts, Russian operatives are also infiltrating authentic American activism and using American voices to pit us against one another. It was part of the toolkit in 2016, and my research shows, this is but one example, um, that our collective retreat into more private spaces online leaves us more vulnerable to such manipulation today. It's a complex strategy, right? One that's far more difficult for the US government to push back against and for tech companies to combat. And one that's especially powerful during times of increased polarization, civil unrest, and uncertainty, like the last couple years that we've dealt with here in the United States. Now, the story of that July 4th flash mob is a timely warning, I think, of just how vulnerable we continue to be. A lot of people say, you know, Russian election interference ended in 2016. Clearly, it was still going on in 2017, and we have evidence of other campaigns and other attempts to influence us going forward. So, being the good pseudo-journalist that I am, I, I, uh, I decided to seek out the flash mob's organizers to learn more. And Ryan Clayton was the organizer of Americans Take Action, which was a progressive activist group that had been one of those core organizers of the protests. His group's website seemed defunct when I looked it up, but I, I sent out an interview request anyway, and uh, he, he called me up a few hours later and said, thanks for bringing this our, to our attention, and then a few things that I can't repeat here because they contain expletives. Um, and I met him a few days later, just before the 2018 midterms in a DC coffee shop. He told me the story about how he and his friends had started Americans Take Action, which was supposed to be an innovative protest group, and they had a history of creative actions like this. They had uh, secured tickets, you might remember this, to Trump's inauguration and stood up taking sweatshirts off that revealed resist uh, written on their t-shirts. They got chucked out, of course. Um, they went to the Washington Nationals baseball team home opener and unfurled a resist banner. And then my personal favorite was when they went to the conservative political action uh, conference and handed out Russian flags with Trump emblazoned on them. And everyone was waving them around before they figured out that they were actually not uh, waving around an American flag or a, or a Trump campaign product. So a few months later, uh, uh, during the July 4th Independence Day season, very festive in Washington, DC, they wanted to create a positive environment where people could protest on July 4th. Um, and they thought, you know, musical theater might be a fun way to do it. They chopped up the high attendance at that event to the creativity. Ryan Clayton said to me, a lot of people like karaoke, a lot of people like show tunes, and a lot of people had a fork. It was July 4th, it was the National Mall. We thought that's what brought people out. And he said to me, this is a, a choice quote from him, we had no idea there was somebody sitting in the IRA social media unit drilling psychographically targeted ads to people like us. <laughs> they did know that somebody was advertising the event. Ryan remembers that on a conference call just beforehand, uh, somebody had said, oh, you know, somebody wants to give us some, some money for Facebook ads, should we take it? And again, uh, Ryan, ever on the nose, he said he hesitated, but only a little, and asked, what's the group? It's not like politicians for killing puppies or something, right? And he thought it had the word resistance in it, and they all just decided that since most progressive organizations operate, quote, in a function in function and operational poverty, uh, the group decided they would allow the ads to run and take the money. 
Now, according to the criminal complaint, the organizers were actually communicating with somebody in the Internet Research Agency, an employee posing as, quote, Helen Christofferson. Uh, and this was an, a carefully crafted IRA fake profile. It was created in May 2015. She claimed to live in New York City, having grown up in Charleston. And uh, she concealed her true identity, location, and purpose. Uh, she had contacted individuals and groups across the U.S. to uh, fund protests, rallies, and marches, uh, funding advertising, flyers, rally supplies. And um, she had written to the organizers saying, I got some cash on my Facebook ad account so we can promote it for two days. We can reach like 10,000 people in D.C. or so. That would be massive. And it's a little bit off kilter English, right? But we've all seen people who write in shorthand or don't communicate completely effectively online. So nobody really batted an eye. The criminal complaint said that the proposed targeting for this ad, which put people within 30 miles of Washington, D.C., in its crosshairs reached up to 58,000 people for a mere $80. And Ryan Clayton thought that that was impactful. As I said, the turnout really exceeded their expectations. He doesn't remember seeing anybody suspicious at the protests besides the few hundred theater people in Revolutionary War getups who were singing French show tunes. Um, and he can't definitively say that it was well attended simply because of that $80. But he thought that it brought people out. He had worked for a long time in political advertising, and he said, you know, even if I purchased these ads myself, I don't believe that I would have gotten that many people there. And it was one of their most successful protests. But this also made him apprehensive, his, his political background, and maybe even a little bit frightened about what the IRA had in store in 2016 and, and beyond. He, he thought, you know, he was really confused when I told him what had happened. The FBI, by the way, had never contacted him <laughs> about what they found out. He had to find out about it through me. And he said, this is just crazy to me because it's like the Democrats were running ads for the Republicans. Um, and this is what he didn't really understand, that Russia has long been trying to increase discord between Americans and other democratic societies by seizing on our real grievances. So. Repairing and not exacerbating these rifts in society means more than just taking down fake accounts and pages for protests, et cetera. We need to invest in building public awareness that disinformation isn't just about cut and dry fakes. It feeds on and amplifies and weaponizes our emotions, pitting us against one another. And it's not just widespread digital literacy campaigns that we need. Politicians and public relations professionals need to sign on as well, calling out disinformation, whether foreign or domestic, no matter which political party it opportunistically supports, as the equal opportunity threat to democracy that it is. If our elected officials and political organizations traffic in disinformation, we're doing Russia's work for it. Now Ryan Clayton understands that a lot better than most Americans by buying ads for a liberal-leaning, Trump-attacking musical theater flash mob, Russia's internet research agency was trying to hasten American polarization. Clayton said, if you can weight the sides, you can really pull at the fabric of society. You can pull it apart. And that tracks with what I've observed in Central and Eastern Europe, where, as I mentioned earlier, our allies have been fighting disinformation a lot longer than we even recognized that it was a problem. I'm going to tell you a little story about the Czech Republic now, uh, where you might remember a couple of years ago, uh, 2015, 2016, there was this huge migrant crisis in, in Europe, uh, driving a lot of refugees into Europe. And Russia, very opportunistically, again, seizing on real grievances, was using Islamophobia as a wedge issue. And unfortunately, this was resonant with a lot of Czech citizens. Russian disinformation claimed that because of the migrant crisis, pork was no longer being served for lunch in Czech schools, which is blasphemy if you've ever been to the Czech Republic, right? And, and that the Czech Republic was unsafe because of an influx of potential terrorists. Now, the hitch for this particular disinformation narrative was that most migrants then and now to the Czech Republic were from nearby Slavic countries, such as Ukraine, not the Middle East. And in a recent census, more Czech people listed their religion as Jedi Knight, a full 15,000 individuals. More people listed Jedi Knight than Islam, which only 11,000 people claimed. Yet these narratives still found fodder with kind of the latent Islamophobia in the Czech society. 
Uh, there were negative opinions about Arabs skyrocketing in public opinion polls. And so the Czech government felt that they needed to do something about this. They needed to combat these narratives. And so they sent, set up the Center Against Terrorism and Hybrid Threats within the Interior Ministry. Now, you'll, you'll notice that uh, many disinformation, counter disinformation initiatives are not very good at naming themselves. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, hybrid threats is kind of a poorly defined concept that clouds the counter disinformation arena. Uh, the EU and NATO, they have the center of excellence tasked with countering hybrid threats. Uh, this opened in 2017, and it calls hybrid warfare, quote, the methods and tools used by individual state or non-state actors to enhance their own interests, strategies, and goals, ranging from disinformation to the disruption of energy supplies, cyber war, and traditional warfare. Basically, it can be anything that you want it to be, right? Which is not a very helpful term. Now, uh, the Czech Republic defined the concept differently. It said it's a way to wage a confrontation or conflict that represents a wide, complex, adaptable, and integrated combination of conventional and unconventional means. And this goes on for a paragraph. I'm not going to read it all to you. Um, but as I, as I said before, this causes a little bit of difficulty when you're given the task of combating hybrid warfare, and you can't really define it succinctly. So the center was announced uh, to great fanfare across the Western media. The Czech Republic was to fight fake news with a specialist unit heralded the Guardian. The Irish Times wrote that the Czechs launched an anti-propaganda unit with a close eye on Russia. And other than that long and cumbersome official name, nowhere in the public fanfare was any emphasis placed on the hybrid threats that got the center started, like Islamophobia. But according to the center's director, who I interviewed at length a couple of times for my book, that's exactly what they were meant to do, debunk stories that directly had to do with the Ministry of Interior's mandate, so immigration, uh, not necessarily only those coming from Russia. But it was this focus on Russia that turned Czech President Milos Zeman against the center. Despite having signed off on the measures to approve its creation um, and having appointed the interior minister who was going to lead it uh, and who was a member of Zeman's own political party, he was wholly against it. And he had also made a number of pro-Russian statements over the course of the year preceding uh, the center's founding. He singled out the center in his annual Christmas address drawing on sensitivities from the not-so-distant communist era. He said, we do not need censorship. We do not need idea police. Now, that, of course, had nothing to do with what the center was meant to be doing, uh, combating these harmful narratives about migration to the country. But it really touched a nerve with Czech society. They are loath in the Czech Republic to give up their hard-won right to free speech. There is historical memory of times when people couldn't speak freely. And so some Czechs, including Zeman himself, even asserted that the center would have a button to turn off the internet. The center soldiered on, even though it was stymied by these public misconceptions, and it focused its attention inward. Rather than doing the public-facing activities it had been envisioned to do, it looked to educating civil servants rather than debunking. Uh, but the center and its supporters had muddied its mandate with this cumbersome name, with this unclear, you know, uh, launch. And when I was writing my book, it publicly had little to show for itself. Islamophobic and anti-migrant rhetoric in the Czech Republic still ran rampant with little course correction from them. And their modest forays into public fact checking had little to no effect. And what's more, particularly given the early criticism it faced, uh, the center did little to build public awareness about the disinformation threat. Alternative media, quote unquote, um, are facing a really growing readership in, in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And according to one Czech journalist that I interviewed, most people don't care or they don't know what the background of the sites they visit is. They consume information, he said, but they don't know what type of information they consume. I thought this was really important when I started at DHS, and I mentioned the Czech experience to my boss uh, at the department within a week of starting my job. As Lynn mentioned before, I was appointed to the, uh, lead a new entity called the Disinformation Governance Board, again, file under very bad names. Um, and uh, this was a group that was meant to coordinate and inform 
DHS's existing work in countering disinformation. There's a lot of things within the Homeland Security mandate, uh, disaster management, uh, management of election infrastructure, customs and border patrol that deal with rumors online that you know we have a national security, security imperative to push back on. Um, and this was an intra-agency working group with no law enforcement authority, no budget, no full-time staff other than me. And I, I lovingly refer to my job as herding government cats. That was my job, to get people in the same room talking to one another, or I suppose meowing at one another. Um, and I told my boss that the checks were a cautionary tale, right? We didn't want to be like them, especially they were dealing with a much less polarized environment than we were in. I didn't want our benign efforts to be mischaracterized and politicized. I thought we needed to communicate proactively and transparently about our work. We didn't want to end up like them. And we didn't. We ended up much, much worse. Uh, in late April, after eight weeks of, of lobbying to get us to announce the effort, the board and my position were finally uh, uncovered in a Washington email newsletter. We had put that information out there, but we did it in a very opaque, uh, untransparent way. And with hours, within hours, the patently false idea that the board was an Orwellian ministry of truth and that I was President Biden's chief censor were trending on social media, despite the fact that the board could not and would not be restricting or arbitrating speech at all. And indeed, if that were the case, I wouldn't have taken the job. As you heard from Lynn, I've spent a lot of my career fighting against authoritarianism and restrictions on free expression in places like Russia and Belarus. But the facts didn't matter to those who were using the board as a political football. Within days, my personal life became a matter of intense intrigue and public speculation. And I became the young, female, easy to dunk on face of what Tucker Carlson was recklessly spinning as, quote, men with guns telling you to shut up. My professional reputation, which to that point had been characterized by careful, nonpartisan work at the Wilson Center, uh, was totally undermined. My analysis of counter disinformation approach, approaches that protected national security and marginalized communities uh, was ignored. And congressional Republicans and right wing media characterized me as unhinged, partisan, unserious, dangerous, and a fascist. I received an onslaught of online abuse, and my family, including my unborn child, as I was very close to giving birth, about eight and a half months pregnant at the time, was threatened. It was hard to imagine, I might add, a man in my position receiving similarly gendered abuse, but that's how it was. Within weeks, the department and the administration had made the decision to pause the board's activities. And I made the subsequent decision to leave an organization and an administration that had no longer seemed willing or able to stand up to industrial strength lies. One of the hardest things about that few weeks of my life, which incidentally was a year ago at this time, was that I was bound by the department's communications policy, unable to speak up for myself and my past work as I was being personally defamed and subject to the very disinformation I had spent my career fighting against. It felt like being buried alive. And the depictions of me uh, with which many Americans became acquainted, a New York Post cover of me, uh, saying, big sister is watching you, you know, Biden's all powerful disinformations are, bore no resemblance to reality, to my public record, to the work that I was hired to do, or really anything about me. Um, and frankly, it bore no resemblance to the role I was hired to do. I wasn't a Senate confirmed appointee, I was a GS 15. So frankly, there are thousands of other GS 15s in federal government as well. I had little decision making power. But these false narratives in the campaign against me were representative of a larger phenomenon within American political discourse. Members of Congress, pundits, and anonymous internet trolls all gleefully projected their own false depictions of me and the job that I was hired to do. They leveraged this fear not only to score political points against the non-existent quote unquote ministry, but as some explicitly admitted, to try and run me out of public life entirely. They were seething with this misplaced vengeance for my having accepted a job in my area of expertise, and they were rabid with the thrilling prospect of ruining a young woman from behind their keyboards. I'm happy to say they didn't succeed. But even more disheartening was how few Americans actually cared to examine the public record about the claims against me and the board. 
in the too long, didn't read culture of the internet, they didn't want to wait for more authoritative information before drawing sensationalist conclusions. They didn't want to know more. They knew everything they needed to know about me, that I was the enemy. And the campaign against me is endemic to the modern internet in the United States. It's an experience that, especially for women with the temerity to express themselves online, it's all too common. And unless we build a better online experience, it's women and other mar marginalized communities around the world that are going to be sil silenced. Republican members of Congress actively defamed me and painted me as mentally unstable, all but encouraging their constituents to harass me on and offline. They used my online presence, one that was fun and authentic, sharing my hobbies like musical theater in addition to my academic research, uh, and painting me as unserious, silly, or a power-hungry, overly sexualized woman. The Senate, of course, meant to be a serious and deliberative body, engaged in the feeding frenzy as well. One of my favorite quotes from Senator John Kennedy, uh, who one of my friends uh, told me is known for walking around the halls of Capitol Hill with ice cream cones very frequently. He told Fox News, uh, I'm sure that Jesus loves her, but everybody else on Capitol Hill thinks she's bizarre. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of a warning here. There's about to be some language uh, that you might find objectionable, but I feel is important to share so you understand what we're dealing with here. Um, again, these congressional attacks were, were bolstered by the right-wing media. Uh, pundits were over, openly criticizing my age, my pregnancy, my intellect, my features. Um, and every time I was featured on Fox News, I would, would receive a string of content like the following, which I pulled from real tweets, emails, and direct messages that I received. And these were from just the first couple of weeks of this ordeal. I still get stuff like this every day. I can't wait for the open violence phase of this war to kick off. Just want her dead. Nina Jenkowitz is perpetuating lies and treason. She will pay the price. You and your effing family, although they didn't say effing, you can fill in the blank, should be sent to Russia to be killed. Hey, slut, quit your job before we destroy your life. Everything you've ever cared about will be taken from you. You're nothing but a freaking liar, and you're going to pay for it with a heavy price, you stupid bitch. Men criticized my breasts, my chin, my nose. They enlarged pictures of my face to highlight imperfections on my skin. They commented on my pregnancy weight gain. They said I appeared to be transgender. They wondered how anyone would ever want to impregnate me. They told me my eggs were all dried up. They told me in graphic terms that I was President Biden's whore. And the US government didn't know how to deal with this. They didn't know how to deal with the disinformation campaign against its efforts or the harassment campaign against me. Instead of mounting a response to those falsehoods and the hate speech, DHS and the administration essentially rolled over issuing a mealy mouth fact sheet and sending the secretary and the White House spokesperson on the defensive days after the deluge started, which by which point we had already lost, right? Later, DHS kowtowed to the unfounded criticism, put the board on pause, and launched a review of its mission, announcing over the summer that there was no need for a disinformation governance board. I believe the opposite is true that the department and the administration writ large have demonstrated they've learned little from both our allies in Central and Eastern Europe and the havoc that disinformation has wrought in our country over the past seven years. If I'm being honest, it's really hard to remain optimistic right now as we head into yet another presidential election season that this battle can be won, uh, especially after what I've experienced. Our own countrymen and women have embraced, as I said before, the tactics of our adversaries for profit and for power. I was recently deposed about my time in government before the House Subcommittee uh, on the Weaponization of Government, as it is called, or as Chairman Jim Jordan has called it, the new Frank Church Committee, uh, after, of course, the senator who investigated the CIA uh, during the Vietnam era. Now, uh, the senator himself, Senator Church, called out behavior like Jordan's upon completion of that investigation into the CIA. He said, the United States must not adopt the tactics of the enemy. Means are important as ends. Crisis makes it tempting to ignore the wise restraints that make men free. But each time we do so, each time the means we use are wrong, our inner strength, the strength which makes us free, is lessened. And the same, of course, 
can be said of the nascent efforts to counter disinformation through the removal of speech. The very thing, ironically, my detractors accused me of being in favor of. I would never condone such efforts. And the countries that have long dealt with disinformation have learned that it is ineffective. They know they can't hermetically seal their information environments. Instead, they have invested in building up citizens' resilience and filling in those fissures that allow disinformation to flourish in the first place. In Estonia, for example, the government has invested in Russian language media and educational opportunities that help inoculate ethnic Russians against disinformation, and they've been targeted by the Kremlin's lies since the country's independence. Civil society organizations have focused on building bridges between ethnic Estonians and ethnic Russians in order to reduce polarization. In the Republic of Georgia, where 20% of the country is illegally occupied by Russia, a civil society organization is training influencers like comedians, musicians, actors on how to spot disinformation and why it matters. And then they send them back to their hometowns to do performances that include creative material reflecting their training. Think about you know, Jon Stewart, that sort of uh, performance, infotainment. And in Poland, a country that's well aware of the national security threat that Russia poses, Civil servants are learning why they're targets of disinformation and how to counter it in their work. Finally, in Ukraine, a country that knows disinformation probably the best out of all of the countries that I've, I've studied, secondary schools and libraries, even in this wartime situation that they're in, are offering training on media and digital literacy as well as emotional manipulation to both students and voting age adults alike. Now, I don't kid myself. Education and awareness alone, they're not a panacea, right? They have to be pursued uh, in conjunction with really robust efforts at the government level and civil society and academic institutions. But in countries where disinformation has long been a reality of life, empowering people to be active and engaged members of society through investments in the information space and in people themselves is always part of the solution. That circumspection that comes from these efforts can help reduce polarization. Now, Thomas Jefferson recognized this and wrote in 1820, I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them but to inform their discretion by education. And that's where all of you come in. We've got a, a wide mix of folks from the Dartmouth community here today. And I hope if you walk away with one idea from my presentation, it's that you individuals have incredible power. You're on the front lines of the information war. As much as we think of this as something that's happening in the halls of the Internet Research Agency or the NSA or what have you, uh, without us, disinformation can't travel. It can't get amplified. And so endeavor to make sure that every tweet you send, or skeet, anyone here on Blue Sky yet? That's what they're calling posts on Blue Sky, skeets. Uh, and make sure that every TikTok that you interact with, do a little bit of fact checking, do a gut check. Make sure you know, you know, is this making me overly emotional? There's a good chance that it's being manipulative, if it is. And, and remember, there's another human being on the, side of, on the other side of the com uh, computer screen when you're interacting with people. And as for the companies, the campaigns, and the candidates that profit from manipulating our emotions, reject them, please, and reject them re astoundingly, resoundingly. Only then can we return reality and civility to our public discourse and disincentivize the disinformation that is degrading our democracy. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. There's two, uh, two microphones. You've got to go up to the mic, or no one online will be able to hear you, is what I am told. <clears throat> now I'll get up and walk around. <laughs> to me, this is the scariest thing, I'll tell you, because the last guy I went and uh, came and listened to a lecture, I can't remember his name, actually, but he, was, he talked about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And just to piggyback, the, all of thinking about artificial intelligence on your lecture about misinformation makes the future look just freaking hopeless. Yeah. And so, what, what, do you have a comment? AI on that? Is, is scary. And I'm wondering, is that sound coming through? Do, do, it's good? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. I'm sure all of you are reading a lot of um, uh, very um, 
you know, crazy articles about what chat GPT is going to do both to academia and to our reality. Um, it's really easy to, to write a convincing article now. And actually, I can't remember uh, who I was speaking with today. It might have been Lynn. But um, when we have chat GPT at the hands of uh, you know, China, Russia, Iran, um, in particular, uh, China and Iran have had a hard time uh, putting forward convincing English in their fake posts. That's that's a really a lot easier barrier to, to cross now because chat GPT can write in pretty convincing English. Um, so that's what I'm worried about. I'm also still worried about uh, visual disinformation, um, which people have been thinking about for a long time now. Uh, we've heard about the threat of deep fakes for a number of years. And I, I will say there are some really smart minds thinking about this and proactively thinking of solutions. Um, but one thing, and I, I always say this because it usually blows people's minds, you know, we hear a lot about deep fakes, these, these manipulated or, or completely fabricated, fabricated images and video, um, potentially starting a nuclear war or changing the results of an election. And all of that is really scary. But there is also a threat going on today that's very, very actual and real uh, for a lot of women. And that is that 95, more than 95% of the deep fake videos and images that exist are deep fake non-consensual pornography of women. These models are trained on women's bodies, and nobody's really doing very much about it. Um, you can submit a couple of Facebook pictures to chat bots, and it turns it into a nude image of somebody that you know. And uh, I think there are a lot of people who don't care, right, whether it's a fabricated image or not. It, it ruins people and has ruined people, in, in particular in quite misogynistic uh, patriarchal societies like India. So I encourage you, as, as Sobering as it is to read about that, because that's a, a real threat of AI today um, as it exists. And I hope that we solve for the current problem and not just the one that's going to come up in a couple of years. Over to you. Uh, one of the things that I found by trying to do th exactly what you're suggesting online is that uh, we have information silos. So the, if, we, if we try to stop um, a erroneous claim, misinformation, uh, they're not going to hear it because they're not on the same channel as we are and vice versa. So how is it, I mean, and to me this seems to be the critical issue, not so much the strategy, but reaching this alternate audience. How do you suggest we do that? Yeah, so um, th this brings up a really good point. You know, I think a lot of us uh, who care deeply about this issue want to uh, when we see disinformation or maybe misinformation, you know, stuff that's not shared with malign intent um, crossing our feeds, we want to reach out and say, that's not true. Look, here's the fact check. Here's Snopes. Here's PolitiFact, right? But, but the people who believe in that stuff, who have bought into it, they don't, they don't want to hear that. Um, and frankly, you know, I could send a lot of documents to my abusers online and, and say, actually, you know, here's the primary source. This isn't true. And they'll still write back to me and say, you're lying, right? But what I found that works, and this is, is grounded in um, a lot of uh, countering violent extremism research that we've used uh, to, you know, to, to counter terrorist movements and things like that, is actual human-to-human -human interaction. So I mentioned at the beginning, I think in events like this are really useful, um, but especially events where I, I get out of uh, you know, Dartmouth's pretty, pretty liberal place, um, where I go to places like Idaho and I talk about this stuff, and, and I can really engage in a, a you know, a back and forth where people uh, might be a little distrustful of me. And what I've done online when I have the energy, which is infrequently because I have an 11-month-old, <laughs> um, is sometimes I'll see somebody, um, let's say an older guy, he's got a picture of what appears to be his grandkids in, in, uh, in his profile picture and maybe a dog. And I look at his profile and uh, it seems he likes football and he served in Vietnam. Uh, this is actually very similar to something that did happen once. And I, I reached out to this guy and I said, hi, John. Um, Thanks, thanks for your message in which you insult me. Uh, I didn't say that part. But um, you know, I said, thanks for, for reaching out. I understand you're concerned. Um, I just wanted to let you know, you know we have a lot in common. Uh, my dad served in Vietnam. My brother played football his whole life. He still coaches a high school football team. You've got grandkids. I've got a young son. Um, listen, I'm, I'm a human being, and I think you've got this wrong. And that does tend to arrest people. It tends to make them think. Now, I don't have time to do that with, with every one of the tens of thousands of people who have harassed me online. Um, but I do think it's part of teaching kind of information literacy, right? We, we tend to be, um, we anonymize this experience of being online. And we forget that there's something about 
the disinformation that people are buying into that is, is very human. And so rather than fact checking, I ask questions. I say, it's interesting that you, uh, you shared this with me. What makes you concerned about it? Um, and again, it's not something that we can do at scale. It's not something that Facebook can implement to, uh, to try to quash information, but we need to connect on that human level again. Um, and uh, there have been some interesting uh, little programs in, um, in some European countries where they bring people together for town halls to talk about these ideas and connect um, with their local communities again. I also think that local media have a role to play in that to contextualize the big questions of things that are happening in Washington or, or other large cities and you know, power capitals, but there's no easy answer. Um, and I think we just need to remember each other's humanity, which I recognize isn't a very academic answer. It's not one that the president can sign an executive order about, but um, it's something that we, we need to bring back. And actually, just one more story. Uh, I mentioned I, I met Jim Jordan and a couple of his friends a few weeks ago, and um, there, was, there was one interaction where I was basically able to, to talk about what the last year of my life has been like in front of these folks. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I disarmed them a little bit um, without getting into detail because I'm not really allowed to in a public forum. Um, I, I just, I spoke about, you know, what me and my family have been through and the role that these members of Congress had played in amplifying uh, the lies. And I really do think we need to hold our elected officials to a higher standard. And, um, and I think I gave them a little something to think about. And, and I did that on a very human level, you know, with respect, Congressman X, Y, and Z. Um, so maybe we can have more interactions like that when, when the cameras are turned off and when the stakes aren't quite so high, but uh, until that happens, right now it's kind of all a performance for these folks and um, it gets people riled up and engaged and that's exactly what they need to generate campaign donations. And actually, one thing I didn't mention, um, a lot of the lies that the members of Congress told about me, they then fundraised off of. Like there were um, tens of emails where they then said, look what Lauren Boebert is doing for our democracy defaming this woman on the floor of Congress. Don't you want to give her $10? I just, I, it, was, it was pretty sick. So, yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you so much for coming in um, and doing the talk um, and also sharing your experience. Um, I was particularly interested, like, uh, towards the end when you were talking about all, like, the educational programs other countries had been doing. Um, and I guess I was curious, because, like, those kinds of programs might seem to attract like a certain type of person who's like willing to engage in a conversation about this and willing to change. Um, so I was curious uh, like what your thoughts were on like maybe like scaling up a program like that or reaching more vulnerable groups um, who might not take that first step. Yeah. Um, and I also just had a follow up more general question. I was curious um, like what the next steps were for you, like after this um, experience and where you were gonna turn your attention to next? Oh, good questions. Um, so uh, regarding how we, how we get to people who might not be interested, which kind of uh, dovetails with your question in the back, um, I think we need to, to think about uh, these programs in a different way, right? So I mentioned infotainment and John Stewart. Um, I think you know if we tried to do this in a very schoolhouse rock type way and it was a government PSA, nobody's going to buy into that, right? Because nobody trusts the government anymore. It's a record lows. Um, but if we look to local organizations and civil society organizations across the country that really know their local communities, I think that model might work. So in Ukraine, as I mentioned, um, they've got a pretty robust public library system, and they've been able to use the public library system to reach people uh, in the regions, which is hard to do in Ukraine. Um, we've got libraries too, and they still have a pretty high level of trust uh, in our society, um, despite the recent you know, CRT issues. But still, they're, they're doing pretty well. They're still community centers, right? Um, and I think rather than labeling it as, you know, how do you counter disinformation? Learn to cite your sources. Um, one thing that's happened in the Czech Republic is they, they use what I call the peas in the mashed potato approach of information literacy. Um, for uh, older folks in particular, they have classes about, you know, how to FaceTime your grandkids. And they, they inject a little bit of information literacy in, into that programming, which I think is interesting. It doesn't always need to be like, help fight Russia. Here's how we do it. Um, I think you can be a little bit more, um, 
a little bit more surreptitious about it. Um, and people do want to be right, you know? They don't want to be relying on information that is incorrect to have the arguments they're having. They, they want to be able to say, I know this is true and this is something I care about. So um, packaging it in that way is important. And again, using, um, using uh, local organizations that know the population, that have trust in their communities, not just doing it from a top-down approach from the, you know, the Department of Education in each state or, or what have you. Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that is workable um, in the federal system, which there are few uh, countries that have a federal education system like we do that have implemented something like this. But we're America, we can do it, right? Um, and then your second question, what is next for me? So uh, I am currently working at a nonprofit that's based in the UK called the Center for Information Resilience. We uh, fight disinformation, document human rights abuses, and counter online harms against women and minorities. Um, I'm setting up our US entity and leading research into how gender and intersectional identities are used in abuse and disinformation. Um, and we also do a lot of work with open source investigations. Now, this is not something I am technically proficient in, but I, I work with a lot of people who are, um, and I try to help amplify their work. So we do um, like war crimes investigations into things that are happening in Ukraine and Myanmar and Afghanistan, and we can use social media uh, footage that is being posted uh, by people on the ground in these conflict zones and uh, using things like Google Earth and satellite imagery, we're able to verify them. So for instance, um, outside of Mariupol in Ukraine, which was occupied, uh, is still occupied by, by Russian forces and has been basically razed to the ground, um, we were able to track uh, the evolution of, of cemeteries there. I wouldn't really call them cemeteries, grave sites, mass grave sites, um, over time uh, using satellite imagery and, and other things that have been posted on social media, and we verify that. So if you're interested in looking at that evidence, we have it all collected uh, at eyesonrussia.com. I think it's .com. I don't think it's .org. If you search Eyes on Russia CIR, you'll come up with it. That was a bad, uh, bad infomercial there. Um, minus 10 points for me. But uh, it, we have a map that's interactive, and you can um, click on uh, the little dots. It'll show you the footage. It'll show you kind of how we verified it. It's, it's a really, um, I think, impressive tool for uh, deflating some of the lies that these authoritarian states are, are telling. So I'm, I'm working on that right now. I'm hoping to write another book probably about Ukraine um, and the way that Ukraine has uh, done such a good job dealing with Russian disinformation since the full-scale invasion. And then um, I am trying to use the legal system to hold people who have defamed me accountable. Um, so in the next couple of days, actually, I will be filing a lawsuit against Fox News um, that talks about uh, you know, the, the lies that they've told. They've told over 450 lies about me, but we're focusing um, on, on very specific ones that they're not gonna be able to wriggle out of. And so I hope you'll stay tuned to see what happens with that. <laughs> it's .org. It's .org, eyesonrussia.org, thank you. <laughs> Did you have a question? I think we've got a working mic over here too, but you've already, <laughs> you've made the trek. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, talk, for the conversation. Uh, my question is, um, so we have Russia who commits terrorism, who celebrates terrorism publicly, but we also have UN Council and Russia chairing it this month. Yeah. So as much as I believe in the power of individuals to take responsibility for, information, for our information and disinformation, I wondered what are your thoughts on the responsibility of government and international organizations in doing that? And if you had a chance to have the disinformation governance board again, uh, chairing it, what would be your activity? What would you do? Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, the the UN Security Council presidency is um, it basically makes a mockery of of the UN, unfortunately, as as it did when Russia was chairing meetings relating to the invasion at the at the very beginning of the war. Um, I think there should be some way, and I've argued for this in the NATO context as well, when there is a serious transgression like this to censure some of the organizations uh, or, or countries that are members of these international organizations. And um, I think the UN understands how, how poor they look in this situation, but um, the rules of the organization, as I understand it, don't allow them to really do very much. Um, and that's, that's disappointing. Um, I think uh, what I've argued for before um, with, in, with regards to you know, national and domestic 
foreign policies is um, obviously the use of sanctions, which we've done a lot with Russia. There's an argument about whether they're working or not. Um, but we've, we've also effectively isolated Russia from other international organizations. So they've been kicked out of the G7, although there have been some titterings from people like Emmanuel Macron who say that we should let them back in. That was before the invasion. Um, that, I think, has been pretty effective. And then um, there's a BRICS meeting coming up in, uh, in South Africa over the summer. I was just reading about how the South African government is trying to urge Putin to uh, not attend because they will be forced to arrest him because of the arrest warrant related to the kidnapping of 22,000 Ukrainian children. So I think those um, kind of international organization uh, efforts have, have worked more than the UN, and unfortunately the UN has kind of, in this situation, um, really missed the mark. Um, regarding the board, what we would have done, I mean, it's hard to talk in hypotheticals, but we were very focused on the Homeland Security mission, right? I wasn't gonna do anything related to I don't know, COVID disinformation, because that has nothing to do with Homeland Security. Um, but it was, it was kind of boring work, frankly. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we had the right definitions in place for how our civil servants were going to be identifying disinformation. I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, for the contracts that DHS had related to uh, disinformation that it was it was giving grants out and things like that that they weren't duplicative across different DHS entities so FEMA Customs and Border Protection the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency none of those entities really talked to one another very much and my role was to bring them all together and make sure that we had the best practices in place that we were thinking about um, these issues on the cutting edge rather than being months and months and months behind which government often is uh, and I wanted to bring in, you know, academic experts, uh, think tank experts, um, you know, increase uh, that kind of exchange of information between people who have a lot on their plate and can't think about these issues very deeply and the people who think about them every day for, you know, 12 hours a day. Um, it was a really benign effort. And, uh, and I'm sad that it's not going to go forward and, frankly, that the, the well has been poisoned in Washington for more efforts like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much more time we have. Uh, it is 6.16. One, one more question? Did you have one more? OK. <laughs> Last one. And then we all get to be received. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today and sharing your perspective. Um, this isn't a gotcha question. Um, I'm just genuinely curious um, on your perspective. Do you think that um, past remarks you made that could be perceived as partisan, partic particularly regarding the Steele dossier, the Hunter Biden laptop story just being Russian disinfo, do you think those remarks, which were quite mi mi minor in the large grand scheme of your career, but do you think they undermined your ability to be perceived as an objective figure? And do you, <laughs> excuse me, and do you regret making them? No, I don't regret making them. I don't regret, uh, expressing my First Amendment rights, right? Just like every American has to do. And when you sign up to be a civil servant, um, you are subject to something called the Hatch Act, which says that you're not gonna bring your personal politics to work. And I took that very seriously. Um, also, any of my remarks, um, as you said, they were a very small portion of everything that I've published, all the, all the work that I've done in my career. Um, they were taken out of context. Uh, and Frankly, um, if I had anything to do with arbitrating truth, maybe those tweets would have mattered, but I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. It was a working group, right? I wasn't going to be a disinformation czar. I wasn't going to be the arbiter of truth. All I was going to do was uh, chair some meetings. So um, I don't think that any of those remarks disqualified me for the job. Um, and I think they show, uh, again, um, how unnuanced and uh, how insidious our, our national conversation is because, um, again, taken out of context, not really something uh, that represents my political opinions. And uh, I've got books if people want to read those. I've got congressional testimony that much more represents me and my scholarship and, and where I stand on these issues. But no, I don't regret making them and I encourage you all to express your First Amendment rights too and then go into government in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you.